Greetings everyone, this is Nightcruiser12. Um, welcome to any newcomers and welcome back to um, any subscribers or anyone who has um, seen any of these videos before. Um, tonight we're going to be doing something a little bit different from before. Um, for those of you who have seen any video of the videos that I've done before, you will of course know that um, all of the previous ones have been in some way related to my sexuality as a fat admirer. Um, and that kind of thing. Um, this one instead um, is going to be one of the first ones of sort of branching out from this topic because there are a lot of things I want to do that I have this YouTube channel and I have followers. I can have not like a captive audience, but um, yes, I've established myself, so I am going to now um, start saying other things as well. Um, this one was actually another request from S. Edwards, um, who has previously requested several before, and expressed particular interest in the art history lecture that I did um, in the previous video that a lot of people have commented favourably on. Thank you very much to those of you who have done. Um, and said that she would like someone, like, like me particularly, um, to have a look at a particular favourite painting of hers, which is the Garden of Earthly Delights triptych by Hieronymus Bosch. So that's what we're going to do now. So, um, where to begin? Well, I suppose with the certain concrete aspects of it that we can actually identify, of course, it's a triptych, as I said, which is a three-part panel painting with um, one large central area flanked by two, um, two side things called wings that can be folded in as panels to close the whole thing off. This um, probably originally stood on as an altarpiece, but um, later was actually taken down and taken inside as a panel to be placed on a wall, and we know it was used, used in that as um, part of the Nassau Palace in Brussels for the ruler of the Netherlands for quite some time. But beyond that, there's quite little we can say about it for definite, and we can do phenomenal amounts of guesswork, as you can imagine, from the huge amount of actual detail, actual stuff in the painting itself. But um, again, where to begin? Um, let's carry on with, with what train we're going on and look at the artist. Hieronymus Bosch came, well, took his name and, and from the town that he came from, which is the modern town, modern city of Schertigenbosch in the southern Netherlands, actually quite near to the border with Belgium. Um, and one of the things I think that's really interesting about this particular work and about Bosch in general is that for the time that he lived in the Renaissance, one of the things that's often um, thought about in him is that oh, I think he was this incredibly ill. Um, um, innovator, look, look at his work, it's so unusual, it's so new, it's so psychedelic, that kind of thing. Whereas I actually agree with some other um, scholars, such as um, one of my experts named W.L. Gibson, who suggested actually, no, Bosch, while elements of his style were almost completely unique, it's much more interesting to look at Bosch not as someone who's representative of his time of the Renaissance and this new flowering of culture and art um, as an expression and form, but in many ways he's very, very conservative and is in many ways heavily influenced by the late Gothic um, idea of the, of, the, of the late medieval world, really, particularly in the Netherlands, and is in many ways not quite um, like a, a relic of that going into the, 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 the Renaissance world, but almost like the next phase of that actually reacting to the Renaissance world and saying, no, this is what I am, I'm going back, effectively. There are several ways that you can use to support this. If you want to go back and look at the picture, sadly, I can't keep putting it out because it'll um, break up the um, um, webcam video that I'm doing. I'm very limited in my means here, as you can probably see. Um, there are several particularly interesting features of the painting which I think support this idea. Um, one of the interesting things is that uh, Bosch never makes use of a lot of the things that define Renaissance art, particularly Italian Renaissance art, but also, to a lesser extent, um, Netherlandish, northern Renaissance art, down from the Netherlands and from Germany, that kind of area, um, which he is technically a part of, but um, I would argue that he's, a re he's really, in many ways, quite unique. One of the two main things that are important about this at first is perspective. Even other um, Netherlandish art artists sort of messed that up, up slightly, but in, particularly in comparison to the Italian Renaissance, one of the things that there was that was particularly crucial and particularly revolutionary about what they did was the use of realistic perspective. As opposed to the traditional um, medieval world where you see paintings that are purely 2D, there's not really that much of a um, suggestion of intonation of levels. People are just spaced um, where they can be fitted into the painting. And they haven't yet managed to get the sophistication of putting them into what looks like a 3D world and actually and, and really go for this. 
in Bosch's painting, it's much more on the medieval level. Um, expanding on the point of Sidelics, I think this is quite important and um, is effectively the, the kernel of my thesis, as it were, is that um, really the art of the Renaissance and the Renaissance in general, the, mass the massive cultural shifts that happened in that. I probably will do another video um, looking at the Renaissance as a historical episode um, in a later video, um, as some people have suggested that they'd like to see that, but at the moment um, I'm just going to um, go on ahead with, with this um, strand of thinking, is that it was defined by a fairly new, or at least fairly recently, fairly newly matured for that era, um, school of philosophy. Now this school of philosophy was humanism, or it's called humanism now by scholars, and is still um, quite an important sort of cornerstone of Western culture today. This suggests that in in contrast to early medieval thought, earlier, well, earlier medieval thought, that um, God had essentially created the world for um, the enlightenment of man, for enjoyment, for um, achievement, for accomplishment, that kind of thing. And as opposed to the, the rather doom and gloom, destiny kind of thing, they often really defined medieval um, philosophy, the idea that, yes, God's judgment is coming, we need to try and stave it off, hold on to civilization, try and live a good life, that kind of thing. Humanism was more about the fact that, yes, we can live a good life, we can live it almost perfectly. And it was this search for perfection, this search for um, achievement in, in doing things, doing things really, really well, that drove them. One of the ways in which you, you can particularly see it in art are, so two ways, these two things that I said before, and um, if we're going to um, camera that line, I think we are, um, <clears throat> are, but most of all, perspective. So rather than just being um, like a 2D image on the wall, it has to look real in terms of light, shadow, lines, everything about it has to look as close to nature as possible. And the other thing which is really interesting in comparison to Bosch's work is human anatomy. Um, people particularly like Leonardo da Vinci was most famous for actually studying dead bodies in order to work out um, elements of human anatomy that other people hadn't really done that realistically. He, um, he was allowed to actually um, take um, the bodies of criminals, actually, to, in order to dissect them and to examine them very closely in rather macabre detail. There were actually sketches of, of him, that, um, of the bodies that he took when doing this. And one of the things that really comes across in that is, is this. If you see in nearly all Italian Renaissance work, and pretty much all good Italian Renaissance work, is there's this very big drive towards people, towards representing people exactly right. You can see, um, um, Often, particularly if you look at earlier sketches, you can see in places where people said, okay, we'll have that line here. No, no, actually, that's wrong. They can't, they can't quite rub it out because, of course, they haven't really got um, modern technology enough to do that. But they try and go over it and say, okay, no, that line's better. It's always that way of trying to, that what can be the best thing possible. And, you, you, and if you look at things like particularly Michelangelo's work, um, um, when you have the, um, a lot of, and, and there's like Adam or God or the angels, anything like that, particularly these... Um, very, very well done nude male forms. Um, it's one of the reasons why um, people have had theories that Michelangelo might have been gay. But one of the things you see is like the, the musculature of their bodies is done in exquisite detail and right down to the most realistic thing possible. Now, um, if you contrast that with the Northern Raisin side, it's not quite the same, but it's still there. One of the things that you tend to see, um, in a, in particularly in Renaissance portraiture, is people shown exactly as they are. One of the things that um, characterised the Italian Renaissance as well as trying to get it right is they tried to make it perfect when it wasn't perfect. So they tend to airbrush out um, certain imperfections of, um, of people's faces to make and, and like hi highlight certain qualities to try and bring outside of their personality or just to make them this idealised kind of beauty, which um, a lot of us would find quite familiar, um, particularly if you've seen some of my previous videos. Um, but in the north it wasn't quite such a thing, but at the same time, even if you looked, um, like for instance, in the last video I showed you part of the Gentold piece by Jan van Eyck, um, still has this very much thing, okay, we need to try and get them as realistic as possible. Um, interesting, in contrast to the E figure I showed in that one, um, the Adam figure is almost entirely realistic as you'd expect um, sort of a, a northern European man to look like. Um, all of his musculature is at the fairly right proportion. His head is slightly large, but it's all really there. Now, if you contrast that with Bosch's work, and you immediately realise that actually, whenever he does people, well, not only they tend to be actually fairly small, insignificant figures in the landscape, but there's not that, actually that much detail that goes into their, um, their anatomy in trying to get them right. They're these very slim, quite small, um, I'm going to say small, but um, 
quite bland figures in, in a certain way, is much, is much more concerned with what they're doing than actually what they look like. While we have faces in, in some of, um, uh, particularly in Bosch's earlier work, done in great detail, particularly rather, these rather ugly, sinister looking faces with huge um, beaky noses, very slanty, narrowed eyes, that kind, that kind of thing, not, not necessarily slanty, but um, um, but sort of all, all things that we would associate with being sinister or being um, decrepit, that kind of thing. There's not, there's not nowhere near the level of sort of bodily um, interest, really, in terms of the detail there. Now, detail, on the other hand, is something that the Garden of Earthly Lights as a whole does unbelievably well. There's, uh, people have actually said there's virtually no other painting in the world that has a level of detail on this scale. And you can look anywhere in the painting at all and find something pretty amazing. Um, this actually goes in line with quite a lot of, with a lot of things that defined... Um, um, northern and, and really northwestern European art for quite a long time during um, both the medieval period and then into the Renaissance and even, and even to, to a certain extent into the Baroque period, that people have called almost this sort of phobia of empty space. As opposed to um, a lot of things that are found in the South, particularly in Italy, you can see these um, really gorgeous, things where, really gorgeous um, images where artists will show up, look how well I can do perspective, I can do all of these, these amazing things. And you have this very good empty space with vanishing lines pointing towards the central figure in the middle or the central kind of thing. Particularly when you see um, religious art, it'll be um, a kind of thing of like the Virgin Mary or the Christ Child, and then all of this empty space around to highlight how important, how singular she is. In nearly all um, painting from um, Northern Europe, you, you, uh, from that period, you tend to find it's stuffed, it's absolutely packed with figures from all over um, all of the kind of thing, all of the frame, and you have these. Uh, you, you often have these really amazing frames that are filled with detail for that kind of thing. Um, but again, anyway, back to Gardner with Les before I go off on a complete tangent. Anyway, um, where was I? Ah, oh, yes, getting back on track. Um, <clears throat> what I wanted to say is, particularly if you look at um, um, at the, the Earth, Garden of Earthly Lights, particularly with this, and as I've said, the two things that you really miss are there's no perspective, the whole thing is entirely flat. If you try and look at each of the individual, fi individual figures, despite the fact the painting is about three feet tall, there's no sign of a vanishing point at all. The figures only get very, very slightly smaller, or some of them don't even bother to change size particularly as you come from the foreground to the background. It's almost like the, the land and on it has been shifted up um, a diagonal slope, a very sharp diagonal slope, like, like, like with a very small gradient, and the figures just slowly put next on the back, and there's virtually no um, attempted uh, um, perspective realism um, in this particular one. And again, if you look at the figures, there's this very, very small... I keep saying that, I'm using that word, it's useless. But um, yeah, their bodies are, are basically just these plain white shapes, or black shaped names in the, in the case of the... Um, um, other people that he tends to use in the Garden of Earth Lights itself, um, without them looking really like people. They represent people, but in comparison to uh, more naturalistic forms of work, they don't look like people. Anyway, one of the things I wanted to say on this, and one of the things that it, um, I think it, it um, supports my theory that effectively this is a, this is a painting like several others of um, Bosch's and several others at the same time that really stand in opposition to humanism and everything that the, so the Italian Renaissance and to a lesser extent the um, Northern Renaissance really stands for. Um, one of the overwhelming themes of Bosch's work in general is that of sin. One of the the, 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 sort of the, the ideas that you get from it is that is this very very pessimistic view of the world um, you see in, for instance, one of his other um, pictures, if you want to go and look this up now, it's probably a good idea, which is called the Haywain, um, which takes effectively its its effective um, um, subject matter from an old D Dutch proverb that was popular at the time, which is, life is nothing more than a wagon full of hay, and all the men and women in it are simply trying to um, take what they can out of it. And um, one of the arguments is that this is a stand on point on both human vanity and human greed, one of, the, one of the things in this, this one shows is there's this huge bale of hay being moved slowly on a wagon um, sort of that way across the... I just keep forgetting it's the other way around on this thing. Anyway, um, with God um, in the form of Jesus standing above, fairly aloof from what's going on, while down below, um, figures from human society, all kinds of people like monks, peasants, farmers, burger, uh, um, merchants, um, burgers as in townspeople, in, in that case is a rather um, um, archaic term, um, 
all people like that fighting and jostling and um, basically turning sort of pretty ugly and violent and animalistic over just trying to grab this um, hay out of the cart, which um, I think is a, is a fairly heavy, fairly heavy allegory, as a lot of um, Bosch's later work um, did, did tend to go into. Um, this kind of thing can be seen on in the Garden of Earthly Delights, but on an entirely new level, rather than just taking one proverb and then um, like showing things around it. In this one, pretty much every last little detail, every last little thing seems to actually link to um, various other things. And there's someone who actually said in um, um, some context that I read earlier about this, if you actually looked at it, then, um, you can effectively see um, an encyclopedia of Netherlandish folklore just within this one painting. Now, um, it basically, as, as this is almost the sequel to the Heiwain in terms of um, his sort of sins, um, and particularly the seven deadly sins, which is something that seemed to obsess him quite a lot um, in terms of its subject matter, the main focus of this one, the main focus of the, of the central panel seems to be lust. Everyone's naked and everyone's being fairly amorous with each other, so that um, is fairly obvious. But then there are other things as well. Apparently, fish, which um, featured quite heavily in this picture, were um, were, well, were given phallic associations in a lot of um, Dutch folklore at the time. Strawberries also particularly um, were often used by um, churchmen and preachers, moralizers of that era, of, of suggesting they were um, effectively um, an allegory for the sin of lust. Like um, you go near strawberries, you see them, you eat them, but then the, the whole thing about them goes away. Like you eat them, and it's it, done. Um, just melts in your mouth, that kind of thing. So you, it's this um, lustful desire, this desire for pleasure that's very strong, that goes away very, very quickly in comparison to the great everlasting um, pleasure and joy that can be found in a religious life and in heaven. Um, that kind of thing. And similarly, all, all of these kinds of things are over there, like, like the owls are also um, a very common thing in Bosch's painting. It seems to have a bit of a, a thing with owls particularly, as they represent two things. It's interesting um, that we tend to associate owls with wisdom now, um, as a kind of, sort of proverbial thing, whereas for most of European history, they weren't really at all, at least outside of Greece, where they were associated with the goddess Athena, who was the goddess of wisdom, etc. Et but um, it, in most of Western history, from ancient Rome, really, until... Um, Again, sort of like, like the 17th century, that kind of thing, they were associated um, fairly negatively. They were nocturnal creatures, so there was this um, whole night kind of complex where night is dark, scary, that kind of thing. And also they were seen as being quite creepy. The way that owls hooted out of the dark, their large, glowing, staring eyes, well, not quite glowing, but shiny, staring eyes, um, was seen as being quite creepy, quite frightening. And in terms of superstition and folklore, they tend to be associated with death, with alarms, so um, the, the particularly feature, interestingly, in the Shakespeare play Macbeth that I, I particularly like, where it talks about, um, there's a whole essay to be drawn from there as to how owls are sort of the, um, um, the announcement of murder or dark deeds going on, and they're always associated with night and darkness, that kind of thing. It's, it, it's filled with layers of superstition like that and layers of associations. Um, but um, one of the things that's quite strong in this one, that's again very different from nearly all other ones, and it's much more like medieval painting in this, is that for all the people trying to point it out, there isn't actually that much order in this. And in, in many ways, the Garden of the Lights is about the failure of order. It's about the failure of reality to a certain extent. There's a very interesting thing that I've read um, um, about this in, in doing research for this video that suggested that... Um, <clears throat> While Bosch probably was actually capable of putting in a bit, more, a bit of perspective into it, he chose almost not to. Or it appears that he chose not to. There's, a partic there's another particular um, picture that's called The Death of a Miser, which shows um, this greedy, sinful man on his deathbed being surrounded by all these um, um, Christian symbols and iconographic kinds of things, like that, that, that kind of thing. But um, it's interesting, it's one of the few ones that shows actually an interior. But whereas in comparison to people like Van Eyck or Robert Campin or other um, Renaissance artists of the Netherlands at the time, um, he takes the, sort of the, um, the central barrel vault, the central um, um, vanishing points of the room, going inside and then completely gets rid of them. He flips everything around slightly, and makes it, gives it this very surreal, almost nightmarish edge. But again, it goes back more to um, sort of earlier work, more sort of medieval work in, ter in terms of its sort of moralizing significance. And there's this. One of the things I think also supports this is kind of is that um, whenever you look at humanity in Bosch's work, I keep um, chopping between toys, but I hopefully can wring some structure out of this. Um, whenever you look at Bosch's work, not only is humanity sort of fairly small and insignificant, again, that word again keeps coming up. 
but um, it's never really portrayed in a good light. All the people who are usually shown tend to be sinners, they tend to be wretched, um, like the nudity in this one is not really nudity in, in that, like, the sense that I talked about in the last video of it being nudity in, okay, I have no clothes, I am showing off my body, I am happy, I am fine. It's naked as in being sort of fairly wretched, fairly um, depraved to a, to a certain extent. And um, all the all the sexy stuff, all the, the um, amorous sort of love play that's going on in this picture, um, could quite easily be suggested to be this whole allegory for lust and how evil and how corrupt and how my bestial humanity is in um, Bosch's seemingly quite misanthropic view of the world. Um, and really I think that, that goes across because you have in in the, in the triptych, in the three paintings that you have, you have God looking particularly sad as he is he has to give um, Adam and Eve in marriage in this case, and there's an interesting link to one of Bosch's earlier paintings, um, the wedding painting at Cana, which um, has been described as being um, due to the fact that it has Jesus and his disciples sitting there, um, not really taking part in anything, and everyone else going over in mad revels and that kind of thing, and so like drinking to excess, um, fondling each other, um, gambling, all all of the things that um, yes. Um, um, a good Catholic Christian would never do, and that kind of thing, um, particularly at a party. Um, and they're suggesting that even marriage itself is actually not particularly good in Bosch's view. It's this whole thing like, no, sex is really, really evil, that kind of thing. And it's just so that um, one of the suggestions you could have is that the Christ figure who represents God in the Garden of Eden um, marrying Adam and Eve, there's a lot of people point out that he has this rather sad, longing, regretful look on his face. It could probably be like, okay, I have to do this, I have to let humanity go and ruin everything with their um, libido, as it were. And and then, of course, you, you get on into the, the last um, panel of the triptych, which represents hell with the dark, oppressive landscape, bizarre instruments of torture. And it, worked, and it fits um, quite well into a lot of earlier medieval um, depictions of hell. Like particularly, you can see um, one, one of the particular features, features of a lot of medieval churches is that they had this, um, this thing called the tympanum um, just above the door of the church. Which had, which had um, usually showed the last judgment, who so had God in the middle directing um, um, good people one way into heaven, so like climbing up a stair into um, paradise. Whereas on the other side, you had this very grotesque um, picture of hell with often naked people being thrown into this huge, gaping, um, almost an, um, animalized mouth of hell with fire and flames and torture and all kind of like fire and brimstone, that, that kind of idea. And again, it's this very, very disordered composition. They were slightly more inventive and slightly more surreal in this one with the um, uh, musical instruments used as instruments of torture and that kind of thing that fits much more into the um, the medieval scene because in nearly all other Renaissance depictions you don't see hell to the, to certain, to the same extent. Um, very few people are as willing to use grotesque forms, in particular like overtly demonic forms, than Bosch. And, and, and I think most other people, like even if you look at people like Jan van Eyck, it's all about how, yes, there is hope now because Christ is here, Emmanuel, that, that kind of idea going on. Whereas with Bosch, there's, there never really seems to be that much hope. Whenever you see um, um, any, any divine de depiction, it's very clearly separated from um, the material world and from humanity in particular. Like even on the Hayway one where it shows um, heaven with um, Christ and the angels on one side, there are people below them and these naked, wretched people on the rather bare, barren ground underneath him, almost like praying, please help us, no. Um, which I think, um, again, with his, uh, his, his sort of pervading obsession with the seven deadly sins and basically his rather... Um, dark view of humanity in ways I think suggests that Bosch was really um, an unusual man for his time. He was much more conservative, much more reactionary, a lot I mean, really yeah, really a lot more pessimistic. He rejected, it seems, um the the ideas of humanism um in his art. It was much more about showing no humanity is doomed than um there is hope. So um yeah noticing the video is probably getting quite long now um and I don't want this to turn into another um, endless half hour kind of affair. Um, I will now say goodbye and um, I will see you again soon. Um, if you have any further requests about uh, this, this painting, anything you didn't think I, I did um, clearly enough, because um, I know it was a bit rushed and a bit all over the place, a bit disjointed um, while I was doing it, um, and if there's anything else you'd like me to talk about, um, 
I am open to various different things. I have several ideas of videos in the pipeline now. Um, if you're a returning viewer hoping for more um, videos for um, the Fatted Mara's vlog, um, hopefully there should be another one coming along soon. Um, and there are also several other topics I'd like to talk about. One of the ones that move on just from art history into history in general, which is um, another one of my real things and something I can talk about for hours. Hopefully I won't do it in one go. <laughs> but um, yeah, so thanks for watching if you have made it all the way through this rather mad, disjointed, strange video. And yeah, um, I'm really grateful for coming here. Um, and yeah, before I go on anymore, I will bid you goodbye. Go away.